deal about Christmas. Philippians chapter 2 in the Word of God this morning, Philippians the second chapter, verse number 5. As I mentioned to you about uh, Westward Bound being with us toward the end of the month, uh, we'll be having uh, no Sunday school that morning on that day, the 30th, uh, or evening service. So, And we do ask you to bring some food for that uh, so we can have a carry-in dinner and uh, have a good time of fellowship afterward. Uh, so please uh, make your plans to be here for that. Uh, don't, you know, uh, Christmas was always a big deal around our home when I was growing up as a child, right? And uh, many of you hopefully had that kind of a, of a home life or Christmas uh, time of uh, spirit. And uh, I had two, a brother and a sister, and we looked forward to Christmas morning. I'm telling you what, I, 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 uh, uh, I'm one of those who would try to figure out what I was getting for Christmas before the day, you know? And, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes I would sneak into my mother's bedroom and into her closet where she hid the present. Yes, I did. <laughs> I opened up and then and, back up. And <laughs> tried to peek in at least through the, you know, through the wrapping paper where the tape wasn't so I could see the box at least to see, you know, if it was that toy that I wanted for Christmas that year. Uh, but my mom was pretty sneaky. Sometimes she would wrap stuff in weird boxes, you know. <laughs> What in the world am I going to do with, with crackers and cheese, you know, kind of thing? <laughs> well, that didn't sound so exciting. But uh, uh, we, we made a big deal about Christmas. But as we grow a little older, you know, sometimes we lose our enthusiasm. That's right. You are a good illustration of that this morning, I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, that's right, preacher. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes we, we lose our enthusiasm for Christmas, and we don't make a big deal about it anymore, and, and uh, I think we're, we're, we lose when we do that, amen, because this is an opportunity for us to make a big deal about a great holiday and a day that we can, uh, we can, uh, we can share about the Lord, uh, you know, just because it's Christmas and it's okay, right? People are talking about the holiday and so forth. So would you uh, uh, look with me, you know, uh, I was thinking, um, like I said, we're going to be in Philippians 2. We'll get to the scripture in just a moment. But uh, Christmas is still kind of a big deal, at least in the retail world, right? They they have to, you know, we have Black Friday because they want to get in the black because they've been losing money supposedly all year long. And, and they want to make sure they have a good year. And, and so it's this Christmas rush and the people buying and you know, but on that day, the 25th of December, each year, the world pretty much comes to a stop, at least our world here in America. Uh, stores close, uh, commercial buildings are pretty much empty. Uh, even most of the grocery stores now close and a lot of other restaurants and things. And, and, and uh, But why all of this, if it's just about, you know, exchanging a few presents or or if it's just about drinking some of that nasty eggnog, you know, once a year or whatever. <laughs> I mean, if it's just about gifts wrapped in shiny paper or Christmas or chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Uh, you know, it, it, is, it, is it more than just bright twinkling lights and family get-togethers? Is there more to Christmas than that? Why is this particular birthday, out of all of the billions of other people who have been born throughout human history... Why is this day worthy of such celebration and so much effort and so much money and so many decorations and so forth? What difference does it make that a baby came to earth 2,000 years ago? How does this affect me today? What is the big deal about Christmas? And hopefully over the next few weeks, I want to, us to take a journey into that true meaning of Christmas together. Let's look in the living Word of God this morning. I mean, this is a one-of-a-kind special book, by the way, and it gives us the reason for the season, doesn't it? Open your Bible there to Philippians 2, verse 5, and let's begin reading there at that place. And it said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death 
of the cross. We're not done yet. Look at verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Father, we ask you now to bless the preaching of the Word of God this morning. May the Holy Spirit of God carry these words into our hearts, into our thoughts, into our minds. And Lord, may they do their wonderful and blessed work in our lives today. And so, Father, help me as I begin, to, as I preach this message concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, your dear Son, who you sent down to this world to be born as a little baby, but yet for a real and wonderful purpose. And Lord, do we see the climax of, of him coming uh, here in these verses. What's going to happen at some point in time in the future? And Lord, we thank you for what your plan and purpose has been all along. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what is the big deal about Christmas anyway? Well, first of all, Christmas is, as you know, the centerpiece of human history. Even our calendar is dated from the reference point of Jesus Christ and his birth. God split history, you see, and we speak of time as being before Christ, B.C., or after our A.D., the year of our Lord, and this is the year of our Lord, what, 2018, soon to be 19. And here in Philippians 2, Paul gives us one of the greatest explanations in all of the Bible for who Jesus Christ is and what he came to accomplish, what he came to do. This is a bedrock, a foundational of what we believe as followers of Jesus Christ. First of all, notice, if you would, with me, the relevance of of Christmas. God came to earth. What's Christmas all about? God, say it with me, God came to earth. That's what it's about. Where were you on July the 20th, 1969? Well, think about it. It was big news that day. 49 years ago, uh, when a Navy pilot named Neil Armstrong Walked on the moon for the very first time. How many of you remember where you were when you saw that maybe on TV? Yeah. I, I do. I was in, in front of a storefront in Daytona Beach, Florida, where our family was on vacation. We didn't have a TV with us, but we were in front of a TV uh, repair shop or a place that sold TVs. But back, by the way, we used to have stores that just sold TVs back then. That was amazing, wasn't it? And, and, uh, and in, the, in the, the, the front glass window, they were showing the, the landing, the moon landing of Neil Armstrong stepping out. You see, it made headlines that particular day in every major newspaper in the world. And that's the only way we got any news back then. And on every radio station and on every major, every TV network broadcast the event to millions of households around the world. We finally, you see, had ventured off of the third rock from the sun and stepped foot on the natural satellite that orbits the earth for the very, very first time. Man had gone into outer space. It was big news. Yeah, right. It was a big deal. That's right. But listen, it's even bigger news. It's even a bigger deal that God landed and walked here on earth Amen. over 2,000 years ago, right. and he didn't need a spaceship to do it. Amen. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you see, is God himself. It was God who came to the very earth that he created. Look with me at verse 5 and 6 again. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's up on the screen, I believe, for you. Oh, let me back up one verse. There we go. And verse 6 there it says, who being, talking about Jesus, in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a big deal. See, Jesus, he didn't, he didn't think it was, there was anything wrong with, with claiming that he was equal with God because he was equal with God. And John, one of the original 12 uh, chosen by Jesus himself, he tells us in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. A few verses later, he said in the word, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was and he is God. Right. And God, you see, yeah. invaded earth. And that is the relevance of Christmas. Right. God became, he came to earth. It's a big deal. 
Well, how do we know who the real Jesus is? You know, the world's pretty mixed up about Jesus, aren't they? We only need to consult the infallible, inherent word of God, and we find that he is more than a great teacher. He's more than a moral philosopher. He's more than a vagabond prophet. He's, he is God in the flesh. When Nicodemus came to speak to Jesus under the cover of darkness for fear of his, of his fellow uh, members of the, of the Jewish council, he said, we, we know, Jesus, that you're a teacher come from God. John 3, 2, you can read it. And Nicodemus, you see, was only partly right. He was not just a teacher come from God. He, right. Jesus was God come to teach. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> he had come to this earth. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, it says in verse 5. It means that Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal, co-regent with God himself. You see, we worship today as Christians a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people make this mistake. Of, they say, well, there's God, and then there's Jesus, and then there's Holy Spirit. That sounds like three to me. Right? No. No. Uh, your, your math is all wrong. <laughs> Some of you flunked math in school, didn't you? Because because you you did it this way. You said one plus one plus one equals three. Is that what you did? You got three. Jesus, the Father, the, the Holy Spirit. Plus one plus one plus one equals three. That's one type of math. But you know, there's a different type of math that says it like this: one times one times one equals one. one. Equals one. That's the Trinity. That's what, listen, we don't serve three gods. We only have one God, but he showed himself. He, he demonstrated himself in three personalities or three persons. I said all that to say this. Jesus didn't start at a stable. That's right. He existed even before creation. John says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And if Jesus really was God and really did come to the earth, and he did, then Christmas is the most relevant event in all of history. God came to this earth. Amen. The relevance of Christmas. Number two, though, notice with me the reality of Christmas. We're still in Philippians 2. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. The reality of Christmas, God became a man. It's not that just God came, but he came to become a person like you and like me. Now, if you were God and were going to come to the earth, all of all the ways you could have chosen to reveal yourself, would you have come as a baby? Seems a little strange, doesn't it? A helpless human being? That's what he did. Look at verse 7 with me. But he, Jesus, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. Isn't that what it tells us? Mm -hmm. In those verse 7, in the first part of verse 8, the message paraphrase says it like this. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. You see, Jesus emptied himself of the appearance of deity and took on his humanity. Somehow he was still fully God, but now he was also fully man. As much man as though he were not God and as much God as though he were not man. It's a great mystery, but it's nonetheless true. The reality of Christmas was that Jesus Christ, who is God, became a baby. A human being with flesh and blood and bones and hair like all of us. That is what, what the, theologians call the incarnation. He was God in the flesh. A real person. Not a myth. Not a fable. Not just some made up nice story. The reality is that God came to earth and became a man. Now, why would he? Why would he do that? Well, can I tell you a couple of reasons? First, he had to become human to be our substitute. That's right. To be our substitute. Mm. And to be our substitute, he had to be sinless. In order to be sinless, he had to be God. In order to be a substitute, he had to be man. So that's why. It's so highly important about the, that that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit 
and born of a virgin so that he might have a sinless nature, so that he could live a sinless life, so that he could be our sinless substitute. And by the way, God also became a man in the person of Jesus so we could relate to him. You know, God is really all about relationships, isn't he? That's why he's called God the Father. There's a relationship there. See, if God had wanted to relate to dogs, what would he have become? A dog, I guess. If he wanted to relate to birds, he would have become a, a bird. It, 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 but God wanted to relate to people. So he became a person. Like you and like me. God came to earth, but he came as a human being, a person like us. So I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know how Jesus is like me. What well, can I tell you? Jesus is like you because he was born like you. Hmm. He, had a, he was born of a, the Bible says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Were you? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've probably got some, well, the next generation, maybe some test tube babies, but I, I prefer being born of a woman, amen? <laughs> he came into the world like billions of other babies, but the whole world, uh, history of the world rested on that one fragile infant. No flashy entrance to let the whole world know he's here. He come, just comes in the middle of the night in a stable in Bethlehem. Mary goes into labor, just like you, many of you ladies went into labor and, and felt that pain, and she had a baby like any other baby. He was born like us. He grew up like us. The Bible says Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We, we don't know a lot about his, his growing up days, but he grew and developed and, grew, and had growth spurts. He played in the yard. He, he fell and he skinned his knee uh, and ran home to his mom for her to kiss it and make it better, I guess. And as a teenager, he learned to work beside his father as a carpenter. He did not parade the fact that he was God. He looked every inch like a Jewish young man from Palestine. He had sore muscles from hard work. He had calluses on his hands and he had splinters in his fingers. He was a real man. That's the reality of Christmas. By the way, he was tempted like us. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Did you know Jesus experienced the same pressures that you and I do, the pressures to sin, to lie, to uh, the same temptations, the same desires, the same drives, to lie, to cheat, to steal. He, he, he was tempted in every respect, but he never gave in to those temptations. He never sinned. And this is vitally important because he had to be sinless to be an acceptable sacrifice for sin. But it's also important because he can relate to you and to me when we're struggling with temptation. And we can relate to him in his victory over that temptation. He overcame, by the way, the same way you and I are to overcome. The Bible says, use the word of God and defeat the devil. Tempted like us. But also, do you know Jesus suffered like you suffered? If you're a human being, you felt pain, haven't you? You've been hurt. Perhaps you've been betrayed, hurt emotionally. Uh, Jesus felt all of those things. He felt pain. He felt disappointment. He got tired, fatigued. He felt lonely at times. He grieved. He cried. He was a man. He was human. At the tomb of his friend, the Bible says Jesus wept. In Gethsemane, he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. He knew what it was to feel pain. He can relate to your pain, to your problems, to your pressure. He became a man so that we could relate to God. But most important of all, he had to become a man, a human so that he could be our substitute and had to be God so that he could be our Savior. Jesus, listen, he was born of a virgin so that you could be born again. He came to earth so we might go to heaven. He became the Son of Man so that we might become sons and daughters of God. You see, the relevance of Christmas is he came, God came to earth. 
The reality of Christmas is God became a man. Thirdly, notice this, the reason for Christmas. Jesus came to die. Turn to your neighbor and say, he came to die. See, Jesus, it says in verse 8, in the last part of verse 8, he says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. What kind of death? Even the death of the cross. Jesus didn't stay in a manger. That's where the world would love to keep him. The world's not afraid of a baby in a manger, right? <laughs> They're not so in love with a Savior who went to the cross. He's saying that he humbled himself. That's the attitude Paul says we're to have. He, he's saying that Jesus Christ is the supreme example of putting others first to the point of sacrifice. What a life, you see, our Savior lived he was incarnate wisdom, yet the world thought him a fool. He was truth, yet the world called him a liar and a heretic. He had such power that he could calm a raging storm, and yet little children came and sat on his lap. He spoke with authority, and yet on the day of his judgment he said nothing. He was the Lion of Judah, and yet as a lamb he was led to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. He was and is the King of Kings, and he wore a crown of thorns. He himself was a living water, yet on the cross he said, I thirst. Talk about humility. Jesus was spat upon. He was insulted. He was mocked. He was beaten and then crucified. Why? He didn't have to do that. Right. He was God. He could have called legions of angels down and they would have rescued him and put a stop to it at that point. But he did not have to go to the cross. Nobody put him there without his permission. Why did he allow himself to go to the cross? Well, other than obedience to God, uh, which is obvious here in the text, the Bible says he did it for two other reasons. <laughs> you see, Jesus went to the cross to demonstrate God's love for you. To show his love. The Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, for though Christ died for us, he went to that cross because of his love. God's love commended toward you, demonstrated toward you and I. I think that was his motivation, don't you? By the way, that's a good reason for Christmas, to demonstrate his love for you and me. He came also, he did it to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You see, sin must be paid for. God never has, God never will, God never can overlook sin. All sin will be pardoned. Listen to me. All sin has to be either pardoned through Christ or punished in hell. Right. Right. Wow. There are no other options. No sin will be overlooked. I'm glad the rest of Romans 6.23, not only does it say the wages of sin is death, but it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, he made it possible for us to escape God's wrath on sin by taking our place, by taking our or my punishment. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, might live unto righteousness. Right. Thank you. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago can make a difference in your life right now. We can be, you can be completely forgiven for everything that you've ever done wrong or ever will do wrong. That's the reason for Christmas. What's the result of Christmas? Would you look with me at the next verse? Verse 9 through 11, I love these verses. Wherefore God also had highly now exalted him. And given him a name, which is, what, above every name. That at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord. Amen. To the glory of God the Father. I'm going to tell you the result of Christmas this morning. Is that everyone's going to call Jesus Lord one day? That's right. 
Just as the crib was not the end for Jesus, neither was the cross. Romans 1, 4 says, And the crib was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. He did not just die, and that was the end. He lives. You know, there are many founders of different religions. Some people claim that all religions lead to, lead to God. That is a false statement. It's a mistruth. It's a lie of the devil himself. Say where all religions lead, they all lead to hell. Right. <clears throat> Except <clears throat> Jesus is the way to heaven. Right. There were many founders of religions, as I was going to say, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad. Confucius, Confucius died a long, long time ago. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is gone. He's dead. But Jesus died. Yet he lives. All those others are dead and they stayed dead. Jesus came out of the grave alive. And that's one reason why he has a name that is above every name. They put his body in a tomb and Pilate said, make it as sure as you know how. So they rolled a massive stone in front of that grave and put a Roman seal upon it and posted a group of Roman guards out in front of it. Rome made it as sure as they could. Unbelief tries to make it as sure as it could because the Pharisees and the Sadducees mocked the idea that he would come forth from the grave. Death made it as sure as he could because Jesus' body lay cold and still, uh, bound by the iron shackles of death for three days. But on Sunday, up from the grave, he arose Amen. with a mighty triumph over his foes. He is alive. Amen. Can I tell you, Christmas and Easter are eternally tied together? That's right. Amen. They go hand in hand. But you can't have one without the other. Right. What was God, God the Father's response to what Jesus did in emptying himself? Here in this passage, we just looked in the scripture. He emptied himself and he came in human form in order to die for the sins of the world. What was God's response? What did he say he would do? Uh, it was to exalt his person and to elevate his name. 700 years before his birth, there's a prophet named Isaiah who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, what, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Oh, yes, he's been given a name, amen? amen? From personal experience, can I tell you this morning that Jesus is the sweetest name I know? Amen. Fears are calmed, and the weak made strong in the name of Jesus. Storms are stilled, and the dead are raised in the name of Jesus. Demons tremble, and Satan flees at the name of Jesus and this morning, as we close this message, I want to ask you a very simple yet profound question. What is your response? We know, the, we know God's response, the Father's response. What is your response to Jesus for what he has done for you? It should be, number one, to believe on him as your Savior. And number two, to confess him as your Lord. Have you done that? Have you believed on him? Is he your savior? Do you know for sure that if you died today, you would go to heaven? Has he saved you from, from hell? Has he given you eternal life? Do you know that for sure? You can. Oh, but don't miss this. You're also, we need to confess him as the Lord of our lives. That's a title that's been given as a result of going to the cross. That word Lord, though, is often misused. It's misunderstood. It's used flippantly by many people, most and many Christians use it that way. Oh, oh, the Lord Jesus Christ, this, and the Lord Jesus Christ, that, and the Lord this, and the Lord that, and yet he's not the Lord of their life. At least not in the way they live. Not in the way they talk, not in the way they behave, not in the way they, they act. The word Lord in the Bible is a word that means master, ruler, the one in control total sovereign king. This, you and I have been called to surrender our lives to him. We're to call upon him for salvation because whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. 
But we're, and we're to bow the knee before him, though, as Lord of our life. What's the big deal about Christmas, anyway? Talked about that in the beginning. Well, I tell you, it's a big deal because Christmas is still relevant today to our lives. God became, God came to earth. God became a man. Jesus came to die. And Jesus is exalted as Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Oh, I assure you of this, it will happen. What do you mean, preacher? You will one day confess him as Lord. Why don't you just do it now? Why don't you let him be the Lord of your life now? You see, one day Jesus will give, be given all the honor that he's been eternally due. All the arrogance of this world that puts up itself up against Christ and all the denial and the pseudo-scientific and philosophical arguments that are, uh, that are put up will fall by the wayside and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord on the judgment day. Everyone will stand before the Lord and then they will all kneel before him. That's right. So the issue is not if, it's when. When will you make him Lord of your life? When will you receive him as your Savior? I pray that it would be today. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us, Lord, to look into the Word of God this morning, this precious book that you've given us, these inspired words that tell us how your Son emptied himself of his deity so that he could become human so he could take upon him the form of a servant, to become born as a little baby, and, and not, as a, not as a rich uh, aristocrat, but yet he came in a stable, Lord. He came as a common man, but oh, how uncommon he was in his life. Lord, he came, to, he came and he healed, and he touched people, and he, and he, and he uh, raised people from the dead, and he gave people back their sight. He did the miracles. He taught your word. He told people about heaven, about the kingdom of heaven. He talked about the new birth and how a man must be born again. God, he gave us great instruction, and then he went to that cross, and he died for us on Calvary. He paid the price for our sins. His blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. And then, Lord, he arose from that grave and mighty triumphed over his foes. And now he's seated at your right hand, awaiting that time when he will one day return once again. And one day he will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord, we look forward to that day. But right now, Father, he needs to be King of Kings, a King in my life, and Lord of my life. So, Lord, if there's one person here who's never trusted Jesus as their Savior, never claimed him as their Lord, never confessed him as the Lord of their life, their sovereign, their